So welcome everybody to another episode in the Head Acoustics Educational Webinar Series. My name is Jacob Sondergaard. I'm one of the account managers at Head Acoustics and I will be your host today. Our topic is basic voice quality metrics. If you have been with us the previous five sessions, you'll know that we've gone through a lot of the groundwork and the underpinnings of what it takes and what it requires to do acoustic and audio measurements, more from a physical standpoint. Now we'll get more into the analysis side where we talk about the telecommunication metrics that we use most often. And this is also the sixth and final series in our introductory uh, session for the webinars. The next session will be the start of the advanced topics for our educational webinar series. So just to give you a sense of what we need to cover today, I'll present to you the world's, the world's most simple agenda. We'll talk about the voice quality metrics um, and we'll go into detail for each of them, where they originate, uh, how we measure them, uh, how we analyze them, and some things to look for when we are doing the individual measurements. And then we'll put a nice big bow on it, wrap it up, and send you guys on your way. And I'll be hanging around for some Q&A after the actual webinar has concluded. So the first thing I want to present to you is a nice table overview of a lot of the tests that we end up doing in telecommunications. You'll see that we have two columns, one for sending and one for receiving. So as I'm sure you guys are aware, when we say sending direction, we are talking about the uplink or where the near end person is talking, presenting an acoustic signal to the device, which then will encode that signal and send it to the network. For the receiving side, we're talking about somebody on the far end sending a signal through the network and sending it down to you, to the device, and present it to you as the near end listener. In this case, receiving and downlink are interchangeable, and you'll hear me switch between the two terms. But as you look down through the chart, in particular with the basic tests at the top, you'll see we, we have the same tests in both direction. And, and when we go through the ones highlighted in green today, unless we specifically talk about one direction or the other, you can assume that the test will be the same or identical in both directions. So for the advanced test below, that's, that's some of the material we'll be covering in the following seven sessions. Although echo test has been highlighted in green because we will touch on it today. The whole point about the test uh, the test highlighted in green is to say these are part of the basic test suite of any standard in place today. These types of tests are going to be almost universal, something that you have almost certainly done before and something that we feel is very important to cover and go into some detail because they are very important for different reasons. And they are very uh, pr uh, prominent in the uh, standards community and in the test suites and test uh, databases that are available. So the first one we should cover is delay. Delay is the most important factor in a telecommunication system. I know that sounds like an outrageous claim, but there's a lot of stuff later on that will depend dramatically on the delay of a system. So bear with me here. Obviously, what we talk about when we talk about delay is the latency between when speech is sent to when it is received. And you may think that Delay can't have such a big influence on what we do, but I think we have to keep in mind that as humans, 
ever since, well, probably 80, 90 years ago, give or take, maybe 100 years, when telecommunications and the telephone system really started getting more widely used, we have been used to one form of acoustic communication, and that is basically face-to-face -face communication. That was really the only way that we could viably communicate acoustically. And so the delays that we have been programmed with as human beings for conversational uh, flow have been very, very short because I don't know what type of house you live in, but I live in a very reasonably sized house, which means if I invite you over and you sit on the far end of my living room and I sit on the other side, and we communicate, we're still only talking about a dozen, maybe 20 milliseconds of acoustic delay from the time the voice signal is formed in my voice box and uttered through my lips until that signal reaches your ear and is processed in your brain. So the most acoustic delay we would ever run into realistically for normal situations would be on the order of 15 or 20 milliseconds. And so when we start to talk about delay in communication systems, especially the last 5, 10, 15 years as we've migrated away from circuit switch calls and the old analog telephone network and into voice over IP and voice over LTE, so the packet switch calls uh, for mobile telephony, we've noticed a big increase in delays. Now, Let's get to the point of why delay matters so much. So the first thing to make clear is delay doesn't actually affect voice quality as such. Because if you think about audio reproduction, if you're watching, let's say you're streaming a video or you're just listening to a podcast, you could have tremendous delay through the network and even through the audio player and yet still have beautiful, crisp sounding audio being reproduced at your ears, and that is fine. But for a communication, or from a communications perspective, delay could very easily degrade the conversational quality. So delay is hugely influential on the conversational quality which there's not one conversational quality metric, but when you think about how people converse and communicate, you can see how delay could easily get in the way of that. The first one I'll highlight is if we get to sort of extreme lengths of delay, we end up in, in, in a situation of unintended double talk. So what we mean by unintended double talk is it's a very stereotypical thing, very uh, prominent with early uh, voice over IP systems, you ask somebody a question and by the time that voice is processed, encoded, sent through the network and then you know packetized and scattered across and reassembled at the other end and, and who knows what other processing is done to it, you as the talker, you're getting impatient that you still haven't received the response so you start to formalize, uh, to, to form another question or re reiterate your question. In the meantime, the foreign person received your question, started answering, and you end up talking over one another. And that's the unintended double talk situation that we end up in. And it really ruins the conversational flow. It results in people having to slow down, increase the pauses between their sentences, and worst case scenario, you're reduced to something more along the lines of a military style of communication or a push to talk type situation where you have to indicate when you're done talking and the other person can begin talking. That's obviously the extreme case, but that's something where delay in broad sense is inversely proportional to conversational quality because as we start to reduce it, reduce delay, we obviously move away from un unintended double talk situations. We get into the realm of, okay, now we can implement echo cancers to try and limit echo and allow for duplexing, so for instance, double talk. Uh, but when the delays are still on the long side, we have to find that our echo cancers need to work extra hard to produce a decent result. So the lower we can bring down our delay, the better. Now, the root cause of uh, delay, 
it's it's not one piece. Usually in a big communication system like a mobile phone or could be a sophisticated wireless headset or a radio in a car that acts as a hands-free device on a mobile phone. It's simply a lack of focus on the individual blocks that go into the audio path of the device. And when you start to add up all the individual blocks, you might find that, holy smokes, all of a sudden we're dealing with quite long delays on the order of 200 or 300 milliseconds, which if you recall the uh, orthotelephonic scenario where you sit three meters apart in real life, the delay is just the speed of sound between us. 200, 300 milliseconds is all of a sudden a long time to have to deal with those types of delays. So just to visualize what we're talking about when we measure delay, we have a scenario here where the first block on the left represents some type of wireless accessory. It could be a hands-free device, it could be a car, it could be a headset. And then on the right side, we have a mobile phone or, or a communication system that hooks up to the network via RF. Now, if you take me as an example, I am talking to you now through a headset. It is wired, but let's assume it's a Bluetooth headset. So my headset has a microphone and a speaker. I'm talking into my microphone. Now, granted, I'm not getting any signals into my ear because you are all muted, but if I were, I might have some echo cancellation on board my headset. I might have some transcoding, so both encoding and decoding, of my audio stream into the Bluetooth codec, CVSD, whatever codec of choice we're using, so that I can send my audio stream back to, in this case, I'm calling in via my PC to the GoToWebinar audio bridge, but it could be a mobile phone as well. So we decode that signal. We hopefully don't do a serial echo cancellation process, but there might be other processing taking place on the communication device, which then re-encodes the signal and sends it via RF, or in this case, we're making a call to the GoToWebinar bridge, but we're using some form of codec, L16, G722, I'm not actually sure what GoToWebinar uses, but there's some form of encoding taking place here. Now, if we start to go through these blocks, we can see that my hypothetical Bluetooth headset may allocate somewhere between 10 and 70 milliseconds to taking care of this processing up front. Then the Bluetooth encoding and transmission, uh, uh, 10, 15 milliseconds is not unreasonable for narrowband. And then there may be a lot more processing taking place. There could be some noise reduction taking place before we then re-encode and send up through the network, which could add a fair bit of delay. Now, you on the other end, you're, of course, listening to this audio stream, and you as well will have some delays through the network, through your processing. There might be some spectral shaping taking place through your conferencing phone or whatever you're listening to now. And then if you were using a Bluetooth accessory, we have to account for some delay in that transcoding. And then finally, the audio will be presented to you as the end user. So as we add all this up, for a typical narrowband system, we're talking about 225 milliseconds being very common delay values for uh, wireless accessories going through a uh, and network today. That is significantly more than what we are used to. And of course, when you look at something like this, the block diagram here, there are multiple suppliers in this entire chain. You may be responsible for building a mobile phone, but you don't necessarily design the echo cancer or the Bluetooth chip or whatever else. And so there's multiple people and multiple blocks that in here each contribute something to the delay. And the balance that we have to find with delay is not to invest too much time and processing in one individual block because the delays could add up so much that our conversational quality could get broken down pretty easily. And remember, this is a narrowband call. Wideband, we have a little bit more data we have to process 
we could easily see numbers more on the higher end for each of these stages. So 250, 300 milliseconds, we're starting to get pretty long latencies now. So uh, when we talk about delay measurements, they are everywhere. Um, every single standard does include them. Uh, and one reason why we do them as well is because we use that delay measurement in the beginning to time align all our signals later on for accurate uh, measurements. Remember, for telecommunications, we've mentioned this in the past, but we do typically systems analysis. We typically measure entire black box devices where we are unsure of each individual component inside. And so in order to get everything aligned, our input with our outputs, we use the delay values to time align everything later on for accurate analysis. Now the actual delay measurement is one of the simplest measurements that we can possibly do. It's also one of the quickest measurements, which makes it pretty good for troubleshooting. I'll get to that in a minute. But the measurement is very simply, we inject a short burst, typically the CSS burst, in one direction, and then we measure what comes out the other end. Then we use a cross-correlation analysis to measure the time delay between output and input. So two things. On the chart on the right-hand side, you can visually detect in the time domain that from the time we injected our stimulus signal in blue, to the network, to the phone, and then presented it to the ear. We capture that in red here. You can see there's some delay. You can roughly eyeball that and say it's maybe around 200 milliseconds. Now what the cross-correlation analysis does is it looks at the two signals, and then as we shift along in the time domain, we look for when we have the greatest similarity between the sent signal and the received signal. So in this case, as we did our time alignment, you can see the cross correlation all of a sudden spiked here past 50% when we got to 190 milliseconds, give or take. So the cross correlation gives us that one precise number that tells us exactly what the delay is in our system. Now, actually, before we make the jump to loudness rating, uh, with the delays, uh, the point I wanted to mention about it being a short test is um, it's a pretty good troubleshooting tool if you are trying to figure out if you have audio connections. So other tests can be quite lengthy, something like MOS testing, which we'll cover later on in future sessions, but they can easily span 35 to 83 seconds. And it would be a shame if you're going in to do a test you set everything up and you run 83 seconds. I know it's not the end of the world to waste 80 or 90 seconds, but to then figure out, oops, I forgot to connect something or I forgot to power on my device or whatever the reason was, but you did not get accurate data. And so one of the things with the delay measurements is the delay measurements are they are important and they are quick. And so you do those at the beginning. They're also a good indicator of, hey, did I actually hook things up? Do I get reasonable data? Do I actually see strong correlation here? Do I get a return signal? Visually, numerically, you can evaluate, do I have an audio path? Now with delay, um, we talked about this in the past with communication systems. Many standards still prefer to use these shorter bursts for delay measurements, but Communication devices have a tendency these days to be more aggressive. The noise suppressors and noise cancers have a tendency to be more aggressive where something like the CSS burst might not get passed through as easily. But for now, I am not aware of any device that will not allow a CSS burst to go through and allow us to do a accurate delay measurement. Now let's get to loudness rating because this is also one of these fundamental tests that we have to do in telecommunications. And essentially what we're looking for is the level of 
the audio signal being passed to the network as well as the level of the electrical signal being passed back to the device under test. So I don't know about you guys, but I don't hear in volts and amps. I hear in pascals, the physical unit for sound pressure. And so we, as human beings, deal with a device acoustically. We talk into it. We listen to it. But those signals obviously have to get transferred over the network in terms of volts. And so what the loudness rating measurement does for us is it essentially pins down a, a calibration scaling factor or a reference factor between the acoustic signal that we're working with on our device and the levels that the network are using to transfer data back and forth between devices. So it's hugely important from a perspective of having a complete calibrated system because if people didn't adhere to the recommendations and the standards then there would be no guarantee that two devices hooking up to the same network would be passing along signals at the same levels and conversations would sound awful as well as you could easily run into SNR issues or clipping so this is an absolute must something that you have to do and is in every single standard. Now, just to clarify, when we say loudness, for those of you coming from the psychoacoustic perspective, we're not talking about the Zwicker loudness or hearing models. This is a different thing. Um, this is really just more of a, considered a calibration factor. Now, the fundamental cause here, it's not that sophisticated, but it's really just somebody wasn't paying attention when they tuned the device, and there's usually a, an overall gain stage that was set incorrectly. But this is something that's easy to adjust so we get the correct translation from Pascal to volts and vice versa. So if you want a lot more detail than we can possibly provide here, hit the hyperlink in the presentation, go to ITUTP 79 and scan through that and take the deep dive in there. That tells you everything you need to know about loudness rating. The measurement process is pretty simple we will present a known signal and in this case more and more standards are gravitating towards real speech we'll measure the third octave spectrum and then we will apply weighting curves so that's grabbed from p79 and then we'll sum all the energy of that spectrum to give us an overall number now as i mentioned there are very strict thresholds for where the product needs to fit in in order to uh, perform satisfactorily on the network. The table below shows you 3GPP examples for loudness rating in the sending direction, so that is the uplink, and the receiving direction, the downlink, uh, for both handset and headset, which happen to be the same, but then also hands free. So you can see that. In the sending direction, when we have the near end talker active, the signal that is to be sent up to the network should be attenuated somewhere between 5 and 11 dB. Remember that loudness rating is one of those quirky metrics where the positive numbers actually indicate an attenuation and the negative numbers indicate a gain. Now, if every device is tuned so that the uplink signals are going to be a little bit low, you can see that at the same time, 3GPP says for the receive direction or the downlink direction, whatever signal comes from the network, you can actually allow a little bit of gain and a tiny bit of attenuation if you wanted to for the handset and the headset uh, test cases. Now, for hands free, it's a little bit different. Both of them are going to be reduced significantly. When you think about the setup for hands-free, I think it makes sense. Rather than having a handset up to your ear and close to your mouth, it is now the mic and the speaker, this, the audio system is going to be at arm's length or 50 centimeters or a meter away. And so we have to contend with the inverse square law in terms of the loss of pressure over distance. And so you can see for sending direction, 
it makes sense now that when we are tuning devices for hands-free mode, we have to reduce the levels basically to compensate for the physical setup because you don't want people, you're not expecting people to raise their voices that much more just because they are moving the mobile phone away from their ear and out into a hands-free scenario. Now, of course, those of you guys that are deeply embedded in this industry, you know that there are correction factors, the hands-free correction factor of 3DB, for instance, and there are things like Lombard effect, but generally, as you move a product away, well, the speech in the near end that will be uh, picked up by the microphone and sent into the network is going to be much lower. So the thresholds are typically also going to be much lower for those scenarios. Now, frequency response is uh, very much related to the loudness rating, but whereas the loudness rating was really just an overall gain setting, sort of a broadband adjustment of the overall level, the frequency response is now a measure of how flat the response is, and that's both in the uplink and in the downlink direction. Now, in this case, the reason why that matters is because in our world of telecommunications, the whole idea is that the device should not really influence the content that it's supposed to reproduce. In the sense that if you are listening to, let's say, uh, well, you're listening to somebody talk, you're listening to me speak, you don't want your device or you don't want my device, the microphone on my device, to have a poor frequency response that completely changes the content of my voice or the spectrum of my voice, rather. So what we want presented at your ear is ideally going to be exactly what is being picked up by the microphone on my headset with no influence otherwise. Um, obviously, if there is an influence, it will affect the overall perception of the quality. So if you look at the two charts on the right-hand side, the top one shows a relatively flat response, meaning that the voice, if you were using a headset with that response, then my voice that you hear is actually very close to my voice. Of course, there may be some bandwidth limitations if you're calling in over a narrowband connection, et cetera, et cetera, but there will be no change. However, if you're using the device on the bottom that has a very peaky you know, 3K, 4K resonance, then my voice is going to come across incredibly tinny and bright and not at all accurate to what I sound like. So if we look at some of the root causes, obviously the transducers themselves, this is where we talk about the acoustic properties. You can do a lot with DSP, but if you get the acoustics right to begin with, it makes your job a lot easier on the back end on the DSP side. So in any case, you know, the first culprits would be, it could be, not just necessarily inexpensive speakers or microphones. It could just be a broken one or a poor one. Um, you know, the thing about inexpensive is we, we are obviously aware of uh, mass-produced telecommunication devices having to drive down costs. But there are clearly also trade-offs, including things like uh, unit to unit, or rather the yield of those devices. And so every once in a while, you end up with a dud, and that's something that could affect the overall frequency response, even if the overall level, as measured in the loudness rating, is done, uh, is tuned correctly. The frequency response could still be uh, impacted by a poor device, uh, a poor transducer. Now, the, another one, less common, but another one is simply just there was a poor, you know, tuning profile applied to the device. So once again, frequency response is shown in pretty much every single standard out there. The measurement process is very simple. We apply a known signal. Again, more and more we're using real speech. We measure the spectrum 
of not only our received or measured signal, but also the stimulus signal that we put into the black box device. And we subtract the two, so we get the relative uh, difference and basically the effect of the device and the frequency response of the device. And then we apply a floating tolerance curve. Uh, as we mentioned, we're not too concerned with the overall loudness, just the overall flatness or the frequency content is what we're looking for here. Now, if you think about what a loudness rating measurement is and a frequency response measurement is, they are essentially exactly the same measurement. And in some cases, if you look through the TIA standards, 3GPP standards, in some cases, the standards will say, you can just calculate the frequency response from the loudness rating measurement that you already took, or even vice versa. If you sum all the energy in each of the bands and apply the correct rating curves, you don't need to do another measurement. You already did the measurement to begin with. So the two are very interconnected, loudness rating and frequency response. All right, so let's get to a couple of examples here. At the top, I'm showing you a poor device. The red curve is our measured response, and the blue curve is the stimulus signal that we sent into the device. So clearly, the device has a lot of effect on the stimulus signal. Not surprisingly, we if we subtract the two, you can see that it is definitely and decidedly not flat. And also, if we throw it through something like the Tosca MOS algorithm, you can see we score a beautiful 1.0, <laughs> pretty much the worst score you can get. So this is a horrendous design. Somebody either forgot to tune it or you know, put the wrong variables into the tuning profile. On the lower half, you see a much nicer response. You guys can quickly see you subtract the two. There's not really a whole lot of difference. Very nice and flat. Coincidentally, we get a much better TMOS score. What I'll do for you is I will play the original stimulus signal in all its full band glory. Then I will play the response as it sounds when it's gone through the poor device and then when it's gone through the good device. Now, obviously, Note that there are some bandwidth limitations, but otherwise just listen to the spectral content and then I'll be with you in about 45 seconds. So let's take a listen. He carried a bag of tennis balls. The scheme was plotted out. I have not told you of my plans. He had four birthdays. He carried a bag of tennis balls. The scheme was plotted out. I have not told you of my plans. He carried a bag of tennis balls. The scheme was plotted out. I have not told you of my plans. All right, I think we can pretty much all agree that the poor response does sound poor indeed and the good response does sound much better. But with anything, uh, we always recommend that if you have doubts regarding the algorithm, take a listen to it. So this is just to emphasize again, and there's not too much tricky with the frequency response measurement, but if you have doubts, listen to it. I think it makes a lot of sense when you listen to it. Now, the next measurement we want to cover is the idle channel noise. Idle channel noise is essentially the self noise or the noise floor of the system. So this is the lowest possible noise that you can achieve on a call because this is the noise when there is absolutely no audio being transmitted. Typically, this measurement matters more in the uplink direction, in the sending direction, where we're testing the microphone path and the processing on board the device before it gets sent to the network, as opposed to the downlink direction. When you think about how a communication device is designed, the downlink direction, there's typically not a whole lot of processing that takes place. The assumption is that 
the signal from the network is what the signal is, and we don't really want to change it or alter it in any way. And so you really just want to present that signal as it is. And the thing that could go wrong is you have a poor transducer, a poor speaker. That's really just about it on the downlink direction. Now for the uplink direction, because there's typically so much processing for the uplink direction, that's where things could get a little tricky. Of course, the choice of microphone that you're using in your communication device could also have influence. And you know, why does it matter? I don't think we need to <laughs> to uh, spend too much time uh, hashing through this, but if there is a lot of noise on the line, even during silence periods, it can get incredibly annoying and people will get frustrated with the call and they won't enjoy it one bit. So uh, a lot of standards include idle channel noise. Uh, the automotive standards in particular come to mind, P1100 series. So if you're familiar with those, you would have gone through these measurements. But pretty much every single standard includes this test. And many of them have adopted the measurement process that we'll talk about today, which is obviously you want to do this in a quiet environment. But we send in a stimulus signal that actually contains an audio signal. And then we look at the silence periods in between our utterance and evaluate what is the response in this portion right here. Now, if, or rather, in the early days, people would just measure without stimulating anything. And that could be a little bit deceptive because if you had something like a voice activity detector on your device that was not detecting any speech whatsoever, it would basically disable all acoustic uh, audio paths and thereby send you know digital zeros up into the network and you would get perfect silence all the way across. However, if you do have near-end speech, then some silence and some near-end speech, you can see we're only talking about a little more than two seconds of silence here. The idea is we trick the device into opening up all audio paths, so voice activity detectors, automatic gain control, all processing is alive and active, and then just have a slight pause in our speech before we start talking again. That allows us to test the device in its fully functional and operational state. Of course, with no background noise whatsoever, we still want to be able to capture just what is the steady state idle noise of the device while all digital synapses are firing, so to speak. So I will play two audio files for you. The first one is going to be the response of a good device shown down here, indicated by the minus 62 dBmO level here. Very nice. And then I will play for you the device, the bad device that scores minus 18 dBmO. So if you remember our digital uh, scalings, this is very high level of noise and this is very low level of noise. So let's take a listen and you guys be the judge if those numbers make sense. He carried a bag of tennis balls. The scheme was plotted out. He carried a bag of tennis balls. The scheme was plotted out. All right, so not a whole lot of surprise there, but the noise is annoying. And just as a note, that is supposed to be steady state noise throughout the entire signal. But GoToWebinar does have a built-in noise suppressor, so you may have seen the noise get suppressed ever so slightly as the time signal I played for you went along. Anyway, the next one I want to talk about is a cousin of the idle channel noise. That is the single frequency interference measurement, uh, or SFI. 
So if you consider idle channel noise the equivalent of, say, a loudness rating, sort of an overall look of the self-noise of the system, then SFI is akin to the frequency response of the noise. We're now going in and look at the spectral content of the noise characteristic. And the reason why we do this is even if you score a, uh, a low amount of noise, so a good score on the idle noise measurement in absolute terms, from a psychoacoustic perspective, if there exist pure tones within that noise signature, typically, sort of rule of thumb, something that exceeds 10 dB or more than the average level. So this isn't a particularly good example, but if you refer to the graph and we saw that, that we had a single spike, let's say at uh, there's something here at 800 hertz, but if this spike at 800 hertz was five or 10 dB higher, even though we're talking about very low levels, from a psychoacoustic perspective, we have an ability to lock in to those tones that are very, very low down. So the root cause of this is typically something with uh, something that is electrically introduced into the system, although we certainly can't rule out inexpensive speakers and microphones either. Now, um, just like before, we're doing exactly the same measurement. We want to make sure everything and every audio path on the device is opened up. So we present a stimulus file that contains some audio. Then there should be a period of silence. And then we have some more audio to make sure that everything stays open and converged. And then we look at this period here again. And you can see if we're just analyzing, let me go back one second so you can see the original frequency response of the good and the bad, they're identical except for that tone that hovers right here on the bad device at 400 hertz. It really doesn't exceed that voice signal very much, but it's there and it's very annoying. So let me play those for you and you can listen to that and be the judge. He carried a bag of tennis balls. The scheme was plotted out. He carried a bag of tennis balls. The scheme was plotted out. All right, so that is something that is incredibly annoying and something that, unfortunately, I experience quite a lot with. I have an older wired headset with ANC built into it in line and whenever I travel and fly and I try to plug my headset into one of those uh, headset jacks in the airline seat the audio comes through fine but as soon as I switch on the ANC there's some interference there that produces a very low level tone which is incredibly annoying and really ruins any type of entertainment I might be trying to enjoy on my flight. So it's something the single frequency interference is very important because even if it is very low level, it can really bug your end user tremendously. Now the in-band out of band is a little bit of a, a special type of measurement where we are trying to measure the amount of additional noise that the device itself might be introducing into the uh, audio path. So when we're sending a signal over a network, we will be limited to certain bandwidths. So depending on what type of call you're in, narrow band, wide band, super wide band, or even full band. But in some cases, we have either um, some weird codec issues and uh, frequency mirroring that could introduce additional noise even outside the codec bands, which is obviously an indication that, look, this signal did not come from the network. It could not possibly have been sent via the network, and therefore something that points to the device itself being poor or poorly tuned. 
So uh, several standards include the in-band, out-of-band measurement. And obviously, we don't want any out-of-band noise. That's something that will affect our overall voice quality perception. And the way that we do the measurement, again, it's pretty simple. We apply a known signal with band limitations um, over a network. And then we measure the FFT response of the device under test. And then we calculate the energy both in the band and out of the band to look for any potential added noise. I don't have a good example for you here, but it's something that we like to measure because it also gives us an, an indication of the actual product performance and not just the product uh, interacting with the network. Now let's take a jump and look at distortion. Distortion is fundamentally looking at the nonlinear response of the device itself. So we typically talk about introducing relatively high levels and seeing how the device can present or handle those levels. If distortion does occur, obviously that added noise is going to degrade from the overall voice quality evaluation and the overall user experience. Now, again, we talk about inexpensive microphones and speakers being a potential for that. So they simply cannot handle the levels and amplitudes that we're putting into them, which it's sort of an easy thing to check for, but I think because microphones and speakers in general don't necessarily come with a voice rating more than they do an SPL, RMS, peak, something like that, and from uh, a test and audio perspective, that usually means pure tones or broadband noise that have very low crash factors. But for us in the telecommunications world, we deal with real voice signals that have very high crest factors, 20, 25 dB. So when somebody comes out with a uh, an utterance that includes fricatives or other um, um, utter, uh, other um, consonants or vowels or sibilances, then that can introduce very high peaks that could otherwise uh, clip or distort uh, inexpensive and, and poor quality microphones and speakers. So the test for distortion is, this is where we actually still use pure tones. It's one of the few cases in telecommunications where we still rely on the good old pure tones that we've known forever and still use in the audio world. Um, but for us, sometimes we have to mask these tones. So typically by uh, uh, passing through a speech utterance and then immediately followed by a pure tone in order to trick the device into opening up all the audio paths. In any case, we apply the pure tone uh, at different amplitudes and then we measure the response of the device to see, are there any uh, harmonic components that show up? So the first example on the graph right now shows a 300 hertz tone, 250 hertz tone being presented and no harmonics being present. Now, if you dial up the frequency to 500 hertz and you dial up the amplitude ever so slightly, well, we still don't see any harmonic components. That's good. That is what we want to see from the device. However, if we crank it up even further, so now going to 1K and even higher in amplitude, you can see all of a sudden the second and third harmonics are starting to show up. And that's what we do not want to see. And if you're looking at the levels on the right-hand side, uh, we're about oof, minus 18 dBV. And so if we're talking about electrical signals, this is really just nominal signal strength. And that would be a very bad indicator of the performance of the device. Now let's just take a very brief look at echo because we have a whole session dedicated to this, which is our very next session. So this is something that is a very serious conversational quality component and makes it incredibly hard to concentrate 
if you have echo on the line on the line the idea is that we send a signal to our device in the receiving direction so this the device receives the signal from the network and we want to measure how much the device then echoes back up so this is a sending direction measurement we're measuring in the sending direction but we're stimulating in the receive direction this is one of those that is tied at the hip with delay Right. We talked about this earlier, how echo cancers and delay are so uh, connected. And echo, again, impacts the conversational quality. Now, unfortunately, even if you buy the nicest phone available with the best echo canceller, the echo that you would perceive unfortunately comes from the other end because as you talk to somebody you make a phone call to your spouse or friend or someone and they may be listening to you and as they start talking all of a sudden you start to hear your own voice bounce back to you your first inclination may be ah the phone i just bought is worthless i keep hearing my own voice whereas the situation is that it's the echo cancer on the far end that isn't doing a proper job. Now, just to note, it isn't always, when we say echo, it isn't always voice. It isn't outright, you hear your whole utterance or your whole sentence being bounced back to you. It is also electrical artifacts that uh, are part of it and and, uh, and uh, things like um, switching noise on the far end device that gets bounced back. Obviously, the root cause, we talked about long delays, but also from poorly tuned or non-existent echo cancers. So in the good old days, people very quickly figured out, hey, if I have a voice activity detector and my person here on the near end isn't talking, then great, I'm not going to send anything back up, regardless of what's coming down to me. And I'm going to basically have no echo whatsoever. And that was a great way to get around it and a great way to manipulate this following test, the TCLW test, by using a voice activity detector. Because what this test is, and you can learn more about it in G122, here we send a receive signal down to the phone. Usually we set our phone to max volume just to make it as bad as possible. And then we measure the spectrum of what we send back up and also what we sent down. We calculate the ratio between the two. We apply a weighting curve from G122. And then we sum up the energy for a final number, somewhere around 45, 50 dB, something like that. That's a good TCLW score. The higher, the better. But if the returned echo signal shown in green here is essentially squashed completely out because a voice activity detector on the device is saying, I don't hear any speech in the near end, I'm going to just shut everything off, your TCLW score is going to be very high, tremendously high, 700 dB, basically a divide by zero error. We're not getting anything back up, and so the difference is enormous. And that worked for a while, except what happens when that person starts to talk. The voice activity, op uh, voice activity detector opens up. All the other uh, processes on board that phone opens up you may get a tremendous amount of echo bounce back and you may not even be able to detect the near end person talking at all because the voice activity detector still needs x amount of milliseconds to wake up so we used to joke around it was the world's cheapest and most effective echo cancer that's definitely not the case and not something we advertise seriously but it is a way to fool a TCLW measurement because it is a single direction test. We just send a downlink signal and just measure the uplink uh, when the near end is completely quiet. There's a lot more about echo, and I think the point about all these tests that we talked today, talked about today, delay, loudness rating, frequency response, echo, etc. These are a great starting point for testing a telecommunications device, but it is not the end point. There's a lot more tests, and we'll cover many of them the next seven sessions. But in some sense, 
you can't really do a final tune of a product without having gone through these fundamental tests. They may not be able to tell you much individually, but once you start to add them up, delay, it's reasonable, 150 milliseconds, loudness rating, I'm within the threshold, frequency response is flat. You start to add things up and you start to see this is starting to make sense and my product is starting to look right. So even with these complex voice signals that we're dealing with, these basic metrics do provide us a lot of information, although not everything. So with that, I thank you for your time today. Thank you for your attendance. And we hope that you will join us for future advanced topics in the Head Acoustics Educational Webinar Series. Thank you very much.